Well, I'm really excited that Baki Norman asked me to come and come and speak today, and I'm particularly excited and proud of my staff. Royce and my leadership team invited a whole bunch of, the, of my other staff to, to come and hear me speak, and I'm thinking, oh my God, don't they hear enough of me, you know, already? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm surprised that they're all here, and thank you guys for coming and, and, uh, and hearing this presentation. So Core Give Products me. is 25 years old. I've got, in, in the room here is most of my leadership team, and that leadership team has been with me the vast majority of those 25 years. In fact, uh, one of the ladies here was our first employee, and I would say the leadership team here that's here was, was all here when our company only had uh, less than 20 people, and, and, and the group that's here were all here when we moved from Minnesota to Wisconsin, and we moved here as a, a result of Tommy Thompson's Forward Wisconsin program, which was helping us save taxes at that time. And now it looks like it looks like there's even more opportunity going forward to move my tax return out of Minnesota with the new governor. So I'm excited, and I, you know, I, I'm excited about my business, and I've done a lot of, of fun things. You should have gotten a catalog. Our business has grown. If, if you didn't, there's catalogs out front. Our business has grown and grown and grown, and we've, we've, we've bought other little businesses along the way. Baki Norm has helped us with a lot of those acquisitions, and we've continued to grow the business, both with internal product development as well as with some of those acquisitions. And I think that's been the key to our success is having lots of, of opportunity like that. But the most important thing in creating a business success is to create opportunity for others to succeed. It's great to be the owner, it's great to be the leader, but if you're not creating an opportunity for everyone else to succeed around you, it, it, you you're, you're just missing the boat. And one of the ways that you create an opportunity for others to succeed is respect the fact that everybody has dreams, right? Everybody's got quite a variety of dreams, and, and I'm a daydreamer. I like to daydream, and, I, and, and I'm an active daydreamer. I'm daydreaming when I'm moving around. You can't tell necessarily that I'm daydreaming. And one of the things, in addition to running our business, that I have a passion about is, is I learned to fly. Well, when I started as a young man, young man started daydreaming. I remember I'd be sitting there and elementary school drawing pictures of airplanes. Well, my dad was a pilot. In fact, he was a pilot in the Air Force, and I didn't know it at the time, but he, he flew spy planes. We didn't know what he was flying. We just knew that he went on trips and whatever, but he flew spy planes, and I didn't know it until after he has passed away, and, and I went to one of his retirement outings, and, and, and all the information had been declassified, and some of these fellows that had been my dad's peers said, well, you should read these books. And lo and behold, some of those books had entire chapters dedicated to my dad, and our family didn't even know that those books existed. So my dad was highly, highly decorated, had lots and lots and lots of medals, and he flew these planes. Well, so when I was little, I'd get the opportunity to go to the air base, and he'd hoist me up into a seat, and I'd be sitting in, you know, one of the biggest jet bombers, the most top secret thing we had, and I'd be sitting there going, cool, dad, you know? Well, that's what kids do, right? You learn from your parents. And so I daydreamed about flying airplanes. And so at some point, my dreams got even bigger. I, I learned to fly, and, and the way I learned to fly is, is I took ground school when I was in high school, as my dad encouraged me, and then I took it again when I was in college, and I got a few hours, and then I quit. And, and then at some point, we had moved our business to Osceola, and Tammy had told me that her husband's company had chartered a plane and taken them on a trip somewhere in a small chartered plane. And I thought, well, that'd be pretty cool. And so I called the airport, the Osceola Airport. And I got this young man on the phone. His name is Matt Johnson. I said, Matt, could I charter a flight to Milwaukee? And he said, well, we don't have the proper certificate to do charter flights. He said, but we could give you a lesson to Milwaukee. And I said, a lesson? I said, so you're telling me that I could come over there, get an airplane with an instructor, take a lesson all the way from here to Milwaukee. That instructor would sit on the ground a couple, three, four, five hours while I did whatever I needed to do for business. And then we'd get in the plane, I'd fly all the way back, taking a lesson all the way back, and I'm flying the airplane the whole time? <laughs> and he said, yes, sir. I said, don't even move. And I ran down the stairs, and I drove the mile and a half to the airport, and I walked back in, I went to the desk, I said, let's go through this again. <laughs> and the story hadn't changed in those four or five minutes, and I took my first lesson that afternoon. So that's how I developed my, my dream of becoming a pilot. So to take a trip to the Arctic Circle and to dream about doing that, you have to start dreaming a long time earlier. 
So my dream to go to the Arctic Circle, although I didn't know it, probably started when I was doodling on paper when I was supposed to be paying attention in school. So there's three things that I learned in school. And I'm curious to know if you guys learned any of these things. The first one is, don't daydream. Any of you hear that in school? Don't daydream. That, I remember the teacher saying, teacher conference with my mom. He'd be a lot better student if he'd just apply himself, Mrs. Madison. <laughs> so I was a daydreamer. All right, so I'm guilty. And then the next thing I learned, and I remember going to class with my kids. When they were in elementary school, they had the class on stranger danger. Don't talk to strangers. They even had it on Channel 11 the other day. Do not talk to strangers. Stranger danger. Of course, the majority of beatings and all the bad things that happen usually is, you know, from somebody you know, but strangers are far more dangerous. <laughs> you know? People get killed by their spouse. <laughs> not by complete strangers, right? And then the last thing, of course, was don't run with the scissors. How many of you did what your mom told you to do? Well, I did. I did all those things wrong. In fact, I used my imagination just constantly. And you know, I've, I've, I've thought, how many of you daydream? And what did you daydream about? What did you daydream about when you were in school, Kevin? Oh, being a hunting and fishing guide. There you, and you've been one. I've been guided by you. Well, there you go. We, there you go. You came home alive. <laughs> that, was, that was the important thing right there. Absolutely. And what did you dream about? Me? When you were a kid, yeah. Shoes. Shoes. <laughs> All right. So you have some now. So that's worked out. And those are quite cute, those shoes you're wearing. Not good for snow. Yeah, I got that figured out. So anyway, my dad was a pilot. My dream was to learn to fly. Do you know, and, and so when we daydream, do you know the difference between a daydream and a goal? Anybody know the difference between a daydream and a goal? What do you think, Ryan? What's the difference between a daydream and a goal? Doesn't seem like much. A date. If you take a daydream and add an ending date to it, it's a goal. So in school, they want you to learn to set goals, but don't daydream. <laughs> well, that's absolutely ridiculous. You can't set a goal without first having a daydream? Is there anything you've ever, raise your hand if you accomplished something significant in your life that you didn't daydream about. Adam, did you daydream about running for the assembly? Nightmares. Nightmare, there you go. <laughs> Daydreams come in all kinds of forms, absolutely, right? So we can't possibly accomplish a goal if we don't daydream about it. So we should teach our kids to daydream. We should teach them to daydream. My daydream was to become a bush pilot. And so I thought to myself, if I'm going to be a bush pilot, i got to shed all these, all these clothes of corporate culture and get rid of the tie and all that stuff because a bush pilot doesn't wear all this garbage. A bush pilot wears a proper uniform. And the proper uniform... <laughs> Are you getting ready? The, the proper uniform of a bush pilot is your favorite dirty T-shirt that says Bush Pilot on the back. <laughs> now that's the, way, that's the way to be a Bush Pilot right there is in a T-shirt, right? You don't want to be in a tie. Not if you're a Bush Pilot. You know, and I forgot my hat, otherwise I'd put a hat on that says Pilot. So you can imagine that I have a hat on that says Pilot. But, you know, even when I'm a little kid, there's myself and my little brother. We're daydreaming about flying. We're going to be Superman. Superman was a big deal at the time. This... This is a Super Cub. A Super Cub is a beautiful little airplane. It's the, it's the absolute, it's the, it's, the, it's the truck of the bush pilot in Alaska. Man, if you're anybody in Alaska, you've got a Super Cub, or you had one at one time, because the Super Cub's fantastic. It'll fly into a really short field, and it, I miss the airplane when the guy's flying, they land in the tall grass or on the rocks, and they're bear hunting. You've been all over the place in a Super Cub, haven't you? A Super Cub will haul more than you can... If you can get in it, it'll haul it, right? So I dreamed about a goal with my buddy. We'd, we'd all started flying. We'd learned to fly floats. We'd learned to do off-airport flying. And I said to a couple of buddies, let's, let's cross the Arctic Circle. So now what do you got to do to dream to cross the Arctic Circle? That's a big dream. And you know, it turns out that, that if, you're, if you plan a really fantastic vacation, if you plan a really big adventure, 
it's not that much different than the planning we do in business, right? There's a lot of things that are in common. So it has to start with a daydream. So we, do, we what's the biggest dream we can imagine? Well, flying out of here, the biggest dream you can imagine is either going to Key West or the Arctic Circle. Well, anybody can go to Key West. So we dream, let's cross the Arctic Circle. What's the biggest dream you guys can imagine? Whether it's in your business or whether it's in your personal life or with your family, what's the biggest dream you can imagine? And then when you imagine that dream, can you imagine and can you dream it just a little, dream, a little bit bigger? If you want to imagine how to accomplish a big dream and you want to figure out how to make it bigger, the key to the whole deal is talking to strangers and finding some kind of stimulus to help you develop that dream. So, stim so this book is written by George Erickson, and George's book is, is called True North. So we're all dreaming about going to the Arctic Circle, and, and to be honest with you, what happens, I picked up George's book. And, after, and while reading his book, I said, we could do that. Well, what George had done, George was a dentist. He's a dentist out of Brooklyn Park. And he had this little super cub. In fact, his cub was even less capable than mine. His had no electrical system, so he had to hand start it. He had to flip the prop to hand start it. And he had a group of guys he'd made several trips up into, Minis up into northern uh, uh, Canada with. And on this particular trip that he takes when he writes the book, all of his buddies decided not to go. But he still had the time blocked off, and he still wanted to go. Well, George is also a historian. So he takes off on this trip, and the book chronicles his trip. And in the book, True North, George not only flies the trip, but he tells you the history of every place he goes along the way. So armed with his book and a copy of the Seaplane Pilot Association directory, I found his number, because everything wasn't digital at that point. I found the first trip. I found his number, and I call him. I said, George, could we get together, and could we have coffee, and could you tell me some more details about the trip? I'll bring my charts and my buddy. So that's stimulus, right? So what do we do to find stimulus? Anything that we're dreaming about, we got to find some kind of stimulus. Pictures of competitive products, pictures of, of where you want to go, whatever it is, man. And, and it's just the more stimulus you can find, the better. I bet when you're working at Caldwell Banker and somebody walks in the door and they're interested in buying real estate, the first thing you do is lay out a whole bunch of beautiful color pictures to get them all jazzed and excited. That's stimulus. That's how we all bought a house, right? And, and so whatever we do, we need to have a lot of stimulus. Then, of course, we need to team up with others because all these things are more fun and your enthusiasm level goes up as soon as you find a partner in crime to work with, right? That adds huge opportunity. And of course, if we want to take our daydreams and turn them into action, we need to set a deadline. A deadline makes the difference because the deadline forces you and sets your subconscious mind into starting to take action. And of course, the most exciting part of every trip is the people that you'll meet and that you'll talk to along the way. And if you follow your mother's rule and you follow what they taught us and what we're teaching our kids and you're absolutely terrified to talk to strangers, you will avoid talking to people as you cruise along on the trip. But that's the most exciting part of the trip. My God, if we don't talk to strangers, none of you would have met your spouse. They were all strangers when you met them. None of us would have a new customer tomorrow. They're all strangers when we meet them. Half of you guys I'd be terrified of because most of you, I, half of you I just met today. So we have to learn to talk to strangers. What would you do if you couldn't fail? What would life look like if you knew when you took off on a new adventure that you absolutely could not fail? And where do you learn that attitude? So I got the opportunity. Steve Wilcox in the back of the room called me up one day and said, hey, would you fly the uh, director of the North Star Council for the Boy Scouts and, my, and another guy and I to the Boy Scout Jamboree in North Carolina? I said, sure, I'll do that. So the next thing I know, I load up these two strangers. They get in my plane with me, and we're off to the Boy Scout Jamboree in North Carolina. And we're walking around. They're in their Boy Scout uniforms. I'm just wearing my normal clothes and my mustache. I'm getting more compliments on the mustache than they're getting on their Boy Scout uniforms, which still bothers them to this day, and I just want to, I just want to point that out. And they all look good in their Boy Scout uniforms, their little badges and medals, and, there's, and the socks and the shorts. You, know, you should see Steve in the shorts with the tall socks. Don't, ima don't imagine it, girls. Don't imagine it. I'm telling you. It's, it's <laughs> too late. Oh, 
oh my God, she's turning red. Just thinking about it. But anyway, we're wandering around, we're wandering around the Boy Scout Jamboree, and I noticed that what's happening at this jamboree is everywhere you look, these kids are learning to take risk. Everything they do, here they're throwing hatchets, in another place they're shooting guns, somewhere else they're shooting bows and arrows. Here they're, here they're all fixed up and they're riding on these things on skateboards up and down. And we saw the kids going on the high wire from the top of one hill to the next hill and climbing these fantastic, these fantastic things here out in, the, out in the middle of the lake. Look at this, this thing, there's a child right here. Look how tall that is. And he can fall off of there and die. My God, if a mother was there, she'd be saying, get off of there. What are you doing? You could die. A dad's like, let him fall. He won't do it twice. <laughs> right? And so, and here they are. Here they are upside down, sliding down this thing. My God. So we get back, and, and they, they had asked me, of course, we're flying down there, and director of the Boy Scouts, and Mr. Wilcox, second most persuasive person I know, and, Okay, the most persuasive person I know. And they're saying, would you speak for the Boy Scout leadership group? So I'm taking notes and paying attention to what I'm seeing because I like to tailor my presentation a little bit to the audience. And, and, and I'm taking pictures of all this stuff and observing. And we get back, and I'm about to speak to you. The North Star Council of the Boy Scouts includes this area here in Wisconsin and a big swath across the middle of, of Minnesota all the way over to the Dakotas. There are 21,000 adult volunteers and 76 thousand Boy Scouts and our uh, the, the, the problem Boy Scouts have at the moment is that the school system has decided that it's they can't let anybody come in to talk to their kids it's too much risk to let parents come in and tell the kids about the benefits of becoming a Cub Scout because we, we've let our politics get ahead of our common sense and so they're 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 wanting to figure out how to improve their recruiting in light of the fact they can't use the schools and and so I, I'm getting ready for this presentation with these kids or these adults and I got to talk to one of the kids on the phone. And I said to that kid, tell me what are the three most important things to you about scouting? 11-year-old kid. And he says, doing fun activities, spending time with our friends, and getting awards. And I said, when you get those awards, do you stand up in front of the group and everybody sees you get the award? Oh, yeah. Everybody sees you get the award. And I thought, you know, that 11-year-old kid has a complete grip on everything that we'd like to teach a child in business and in family and in anything necessary to become successful. If you'll do fun activities with your friends, spend time with your friends, and get awards with your friends, you'll do more of it. And does that look like a good formula? So if you take the three things that I figured out on my own, daydream, talk to strangers, and run with the scissors, which means take risk, and you add to that doing fun activities with your friends and getting awards, my God, that's an entire business degree. <laughs> you, you guys can all walk out of here with your masters just by remembering that. So now you're going to daydream about what's your journey in life going to be like, and will your journey take you past the end of the road? You know, and how far past the end of the road will it take you? Because the end of the road is, I, I think that's a metaphor for how far you can see today. So I think we all have an end of the road in sight. And every time we get there, we can see a little further. So how far will your journey take you, <coughs> excuse me, past the end of the road? Are you guys followers, organizers, or leaders? Raise your hand if you're a follower. Oh, we got one follower in the room. All right, how about an organizer? Oh, I didn't mean to raise my hand, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, what about a leader? All right, we all, we all want to be better leaders, and we all would like to be a little bit better organizers. I think there's two kinds of leaders, and I learned about this in a book and with, that, that Steve and I have been studying as a business book for with our, with our team and our entire leadership team and management group has been studying this book. It's called Traction by Gino Wickman. And Traction talks about two kinds of leaders, a visionary and an integrator. What's a visionary? Man, a visionary is the guy that can see the big picture. He's the guy that can, that can look out in the distance and, and he can see things that haven't happened yet. He's just imagining a new reality and he sees it in living color. 
He's the guy that when you're going to build a building, right? Like we've got a builder here. He's the guy who's going to build the building. He's the guy that can stand there and he can look at that lot and he can see the building. He can tell you where the trees are going to be, where the parking lot's going to be, where the employees are going to have lunch. He can see it all. He can look at it on a, on a plan, right, that's all lines. And he can tell you where the sink's going to be and how the traffic's going to move to and from the bathroom, right? I mean, they could see it. They could just see it. And if you got a guy that's not a visionary, he can't, he can't grasp it. And the visionary guy can't understand why this guy can't see it. And a highly organized person and the follower can't understand why that visionary's got so much blowing smoke up everybody all the time. Because <laughs> they just can't imagine, right? And so the visionary, he's, sometimes he's the entrepreneur. Sometimes he's the sales guy. Sometimes he's the guy that, that drives the culture of the business. Frequently, he's the guy that drives the culture of the business. And frequently, he's the guy that makes decisions emotionally, not logically. This visionary is also not a couple of things. He's not very good with details. He's not very good at running day-to-day -day things because the details kind of, he sees a shiny object and goes in the other direction all the time. I know, I've seen a lot of shiny objects. Sometimes he's not good at follow through and sometimes he's not as focused as everybody else would like him to be. Then we have the integrator. When we have a good organization, I'm proud of my integrator sitting right here, Royce Kier is, 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 is functions as our integrator. And I gotta tell you, it's the most freeing thing I ever experienced when we're going through this study and we're learning about this business concept of a visionary and an integrator. Because the visionary, in my case, I can't speak for anybody else, but a visionary, I think, typically is frustrated that he's not a better organizer. And I think a lot of times the organizer's kind of frustrated that he's not a better visionary. And so when we read the book and we started studying this and found out it's okay to be the visionary and not be frustrated with the other, and it's okay to be the integrator or the organizer and not be frustrated in the other way, but everybody accept their function, and it just, I just felt like it was just a freeing experience to learn those details. So the visionary has 20 big ideas, He's creative, big relationships, problem solving, he's emotional. The organizer, the detail guy, he does, he's in a lead, manage, and hold people accountable. He knows the details, boom to boom to boom to boom, right? And he likes building the details. And his request to me is just get out of the way and let me do it, right? Which is hard. It's hard to let go and let somebody else do it, right? So get out of the way and let me do it. And, and a business has lots of highly organized people for every one or two visionaries, right? Your, your integrator will manage the P&L, he'll remove obstacles and barriers, he'll do special projects, and he's going to be very logical. Now, if you're taking a trip to the Arctic Circle, and you've got one guy that's a visionary, he's the guy that comes up with the stupid idea, let's go to the Arctic Circle. Then you get together with your buddy that's organized, and you've got to sell him because he's going to give you all the objections. Your, everybody else around the visionary offers objections. So they'll give you all the objections. You've got to overcome those objections. Finally, you get him talked into it, and he'll say, all right, I'm going. But if we're going, we're not going to fly in bad weather. We're not going to fly in the rain. We're not, going to, we're not going to fly in high winds. We're not going to do any of this stupid stuff that you always want to talk me into. <laughs> Until the first day. And then on the first day of the trip, when you're landing and there's a tornado coming over the hill, and you pull into the hangar before you even shut your engine down and you and they go wow we did it all already today my buddy's name is Wolfgang and I was traveling with on that trip and this is Wolfgang right here so we're getting organized so what are you guys are you guys what kind of are you, any of you visionaries got some visionaries in the room absolutely got any integrators or organize highly organized look at there plays out true right few visionaries lots of organized people so you have to know your strengths and you have to know are you the visionary or are you the integrator and you have to know how to relate to other people based on that and you have to know if you're the follower, and it's not bad to be a follower. It's just know who you are and where you are. In fact, I think you should pay particular attention to your leadership and your leadership style, and you should know, are you this kind of leader? Are you this really, really, really slick leader? Or are you this guy? <laughs> In my case, at any given time, I'm any one of those. <laughs> I'd rather, I gotta tell you, I'd rather be this guy. I'd rather be the guy that's approachable, that's comfortable to talk to, that's, that's fun. And what you don't realize is that's the same Superman that was the little guy in the previous picture. That's my younger brother on the left there, and I don't know who the guy is on the right, but they're at a costume party. 
And the picture on the right, I got to tell you, I was out at a farm one day and I saw it. I took this picture and I texted it to my brother and I said, thinking of you. <laughs> I was so proud of that. I'm even more proud to tell you. All right, part of the plan here, if we're going to take a trip to the Arctic Circle, we got to be prepared. We got to know where we're going, how we're getting there, where is our fuel going to be, where is our stops going to be, what's our emergency plan, what different lakes can we land on, where can we set down if we get into bad weather, where can we get weather reporting, where can we not, and all that stuff gets considered. So those are all issues. And the method for solving issues is to identify an issue, solve it, and discuss it. Right? Sometimes the best way to solve an issue is to just roll over and go back to sleep in your tent. Right? Because that, because now you've identified the issue. The weather sucks. Go to sleep. Right? Just lay low. Stay there. But that's the process in business. Identify, discuss, solve. Now, as a pilot, we do lots of training. I do training every year. Lots of training. And I like merit badges. I like to get awards. So every time I do training, I get another rating. So now I've got as many ratings as I can get without becoming an air, air transport pilot, meaning having the rating to fly, to fly an airline. But I got all the other ratings I could get except ATP. Because I thought, well, if I'm going to do the work, I want to get the merit badge, right? So I'm an instructor on seaplanes, multi-engine, instrument. I mean, everything I did, I got a rating for Because I wanted awards. And we're all the same way. If we're going to do the work, let's get the awards. And all that work involves studying processes and procedures. And it's interesting that in aviation, all these processes and procedures are massive books of stuff. And we have that in our business. Boy, you go in Deb's office, and she's got massive books of procedures. But what do people really use? On a day-in, day-out basis, they use the checklist. That's the most important thing, is the checklist. Because that means that we thought about everything we need to do along the way, whether we're flying on a trip or whether we're running a business. It's all the same. And then, of course, we have to understand our dashboards and our timelines. But the last thing we need to do to get everybody involved in agreeing to go on this trip to the Arctic or going on to launch this new product. We've got a new product we launched last year right here. right? This is a back pain device. It's spectacular. You stick it on your back, turn it on, and your pain goes away. So the last thing you got to do is you got to get buy-in. You got to share that vision with everybody else in the room. Everybody else in the crew has to understand what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, and when we're going to do it, and get buy-in. And what you're doing is you're sharing a dream. When you share a dream, you help it become everybody else's reality. The big dirty secret is when you're in business and you share a daydream with all of your staff, they think you know what you're doing and that you've got it all figured out. <laughs> they don't know that you're making it up along the way. They think you already know. And so they're a little bit afraid to offer suggestions because he knows what he's doing. My God, he owns the company. Well, that just means he's made more mistakes than you have, right? So when somebody's sharing a daydream, offer objections. And objections come in the form of open and honest dialogue. And in a good culture, we use healthy tension. We agree that it's okay to disagree. Because if we don't agree that it's okay to disagree, we'll make huge mistakes. You've read, about, you've read about airline accidents where they didn't properly employ the cockpit management. The co-pilot didn't challenge the pilot and the pilot flew it into, a, into an accident because the co-pilot didn't they killed 150 people right behind them. I mean, we study the accidents in aviation and it's amazing how we'll let each other go knowing there's about to be a problem and we won't bring it up. They were talking in some meeting I was in the last couple days about yesterday about the about the Challenger. Remember the Challenger took off and old Sally Ride was up there, kaboom! Sally Ride went off like a, like a firework, right? And so did the whole crew. When they got there, there was 31 people in the room, all said, yes, it's good to launch. Yes, it's good to launch. Yes, it's good to launch. One guy said, well, everybody else says it's good to launch. I better say it's good to launch, but it's cold out. And those O-rings don't do well in that booster rocket when it's cold out. And so he squelched his desire to say no. And only one guy had to say no, and they just scrubbed the launch. And he squelched his desire to say no. The O-rings failed on takeoff, and they blew that rocket up. Had they waited till it was warmer, those O-rings wouldn't have been a problem. Or, in my mind, had they chosen different O-rings. But anyway, you've got to be open and honest and willing to challenge each other and overcome objections. That's, that's half the fun of doing business. 
is being willing to share your point of view and argue. The other thing we like to know in aviation and in business, we like to know our key performance indicators. We want to know how we're doing along the way. If you're flying this airplane right here, how successful are you going to be? Now, I realize none of you are pilots. But if you don't have any radios and you don't have any instruments, do you think that airplane's going to go anywhere very successfully? No. We need to know our key performance indicators. In our business, we put up a once a week chart looks like this. The stuff that's red, we pay a lot of attention to. The stuff that's green, we celebrate. And it builds a big picture for us by being able to quickly look at that in color. That's no different than the color that I could see up here in this airplane, right? I got nice color gauges. I got some redundancy. Those two instruments are the same. So that if one of them fails, you can tell there's a problem, right? So it's the same thing in business. How do we challenge each other? How do we know our key performance indicators? And how do we make sure that we're staying on plan? And how do we forecast that we got a problem before we get so deep into it, we can't see it? Forecasting is an important part of everything in business and, on, and in everything we do. How do we look forward, looking at a weather forecast, how do we look forward and decide it's OK to travel? If we're here, it's probably pretty nice, high pressure. If we're over in here, we probably got a problem. If we're going out in a boat looking at polar bears, and we don't know that the wind's going to pick up and a storm's going to come and blow us into that shoreline, we're likely to get to know that polar bear a lot better than we want to, right? So when you're up, and, and that's in Churchill, Churchill, Manitoba. And that's not very far from here. In a little bitty plane, you can be there in two days. You'd be amazed how close we are to the polar bears. In our business, we use, we use ITR Economics, the Institute for Trend Research. And we study the weather, the forecast, using the Institute for Trend Research. And, and sometimes the forecaster is wrong, just like the weather forecaster. So the weather forecaster from ITR had been predicting that we'd be back in a recession by now. He's since changed his forecast. And now he's saying it looks like if we have anything, it'll be a mild disruption towards the end of the summer. And then we should be moving forward all the way to 1990, or what, 2019 before we have a, another, another major meltdown. Checklists. So if we're doing this in business, if we're trained, 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 if we're learning our operational procedures like this, and if we get them down to the point where, they're a check, where we can operate off of a checklist, then we know we've done a good job with training. The, and a checklist, what's the difference between a checklist and a to-do list? What's the difference, Ben, between a checklist and a to-do list? To-do list is something you need to get done in the future. A checklist is something you have to get done today. <laughs> OK, that could be. I think a checklist is something you need to consider today. And a to-do list is something you need to do. So if I'm going through a checklist, I'm checking off, OK, it says landing lights. Well, it's daylight. I don't need the landing lights, right? The, if it says fuel's turned on, I probably ought to do that, right? So on down the line. So a checklist reminds us to consider everything we want to consider along the way. A to-do list reminds us to do, to do it. An emergency procedure also comes in the form of a checklist, right? If you've got a fire on board, it check, you, you you, know, you, you do the things you can do from memory, then you go to the checklist and say, OK, shut down that engine, turn off that gas, turn off the electrical system, declare an emergency, descend to a safer altitude where you can get some air, right? Whatever it is, checklists. Can you kill yourself by not using your checklist? Ben says yes. What do you think? Can, can, you, can you kill yourself in business by not using your checklist? That looked familiar. That's my uh, little bald spot covered up there. And that's my airplane upside down. The one in the video was not my airplane. Failure to use the checklist. So on takeoff, I failed to retract my landing gear. Failure to do the checklist. So if you fail to do the checklist, and so now when I went over, in the same fashion that that airplane went over, I went over so fast and so violently it 
it knocked me out for a moment because I don't recall the accident. I recall touching the water. I recall my seatbelt getting tight. And then I recall opening my eyes going, wow, I'm underwater. I have what's left of my breath to get out of here. Now, when the chips are down, you will do exactly what you train to do because you won't have time to think. You'll only do exactly what you trained to do. And you won't do any more. So if I didn't train, then I would remove my seatbelt and go look for air. If I remove my seatbelt and go look for air, then as the airplane sinks, the nose goes down first, the tail stays up, and it sinks like that. And as the airplane sinks, I go look for air in the tail of the plane because that's where the air is going to be. But the door is in the front of the plane. And the only way to get out is to get out through the door. So the training that a seaplane pilot goes through, and when I've trained other people, and I've done a lot of training of other people, the training that you learn is leave the seatbelt on. So I, so I come to, I realize I'm, I'm wet, I'm underwater, I have what's left of my breath to get out of here, my hand goes to the seatbelt, and in my head I hear, door first. And I reach over and I find the door. So I'm upside down, but if I'm upside down, think about it, if you were upside down in your car, and you had the seatbelt on, would you know where the door was? Would you know where the radio is? You'd know, you'd know where everything is. You'd even know where the glove box is. Because as long as you're still strapped in, everything's oriented exactly the way it should be. As soon as you remove the seatbelt and start look, looking for air, now everything's disoriented. It can't see, right? So I leave the seatbelt on, I go, seatbelt, door first. I open the door, I push the door open, I remove the seatbelt, and I don't recall getting out of the plane. I just recall that the next thing I know, I'm standing on top of the plane like Bob is there, and I'm hollering, and I'm hollering for help, and some fishermen come over, and, and, and they come, they come and, and get me, and I, I get off the, excuse me, I get off the float, and I swim over to their boat, and, and as I'm swimming from here to the end of the table away towards their boat, I'm thinking, wow, can I swim? Did I break anything? And I get to their boat, and I grab on the side of the boat, and I says, you guys got a ladder? And I'm in a daze, man. I'm just totally in shock. And they said, no, they didn't have a ladder, and I somehow pulled myself up into these people's boat. And it wasn't a very big boat. And I pulled myself up into the boat, and the only thing I could remember was the 800 number at work because I've recited it a million times to people. You know, when I hand out my brochure, call our number, here's our number. So I could remember our 800 number at work. I couldn't remember my wife's cell phone number. I couldn't remember a direct. Only thing I could remember at that moment was the 800 number at work. And so I called the 800 number, and I asked for somebody, and I said, go in my office and close the door. I asked for Sarah. She's not here. And I said, go in my office and close the door. And then I gave her an instruction. I need you to call all these people. I'm on this lake, and here's what happened. And after I gave her all those instructions, she says, well, are you OK? And I said, I don't know. I think so. And so. A few hours later, I sat on the side of the, the lake. This is Clear Lake up, or this is, oh, I can't remember what the name of the lake is. Anyway, it's just north, it's just north of Osceola. And, uh, and a bunch of my friends showed up. One of these guys brought this boom truck, and they brought out a whole bunch of equipment, and they helped us get it off of the water and turn it over, take the wings off, put it on a truck, and, and haul it home. So the point is, you don't want to have get their itis. That's what that was. That's what they call that. Get their itis, and that's what I did. I got so excited about where I was going that I didn't do my checklist. So, one of the rules that I think you have in business, in flying, and whatever you do, is know when to make a new decision. So we talk about this in our business, and this is a pretty clear example right here. We talk about this: make the best decision you can make with the information that you have. You can always make a new decision in the future when you have new information. But the trick is, don't beat up the old decision and don't beat up the previous decision maker. Because if we believe we have the right people working with us, if they made the previous decision with the best information that they had at the time, they made the best decision they could make at that moment. And unless their goal is to make a poor decision, which I don't believe we have people that have goals to make poor decisions, I think everybody's goal is to make the best decision you can make with the information you have at the time. And I think where we foul up is when we start getting involved in blaming rather than in simply making a new decision. 
So if we're going to do a, make a decision, whether it's to take off, whether it's to land with your gear up, land with your gear down, okay, you got to know, it hurts to stand up here in front of a crowd, put the dumbass stamp on my forehead and show you the picture of me dumping my airplane, right? But interestingly enough, when I do this presentation for a bunch of pilots, they're thrilled that I share that information and what happened and why, right? So know how to make the best decision you can make. Would you take off on this day? You're late, you got, a, you got something you got to do, your wife expects you home, would you take off? Or would you suffer the fact that she's disappointed that you didn't get home and she might even be mad, but whoever it is that's waiting for you on the other end is never going to have stood there and looked at that decision and had to decide whether or not to make a go or a no-go decision. I will guarantee you the hardest decision to make in aviation and the hardest decision to make in business is to not take an action. Because we're programmed once we start going in a direction to take action. And so, and if you're visionary, you're really focused on taking action. And you're hoping that your other people will throttle you back and talk you out of it because you're so purpose-driven and so focused, you want to go forward. And you need objections you can't overcome to talk you out of it. So know when to make the best decision you can make. And as a team, understand the weather, understand all the circumstances. The following day here, they won't bury you. That day, everybody will be at your funeral tomorrow. So we've done all our planning. We've talked to strangers. We've daydreamed. We're ready now to run with the scissors. We're ready to take off on our trip for the Arctic. Our planning is complete. We're ready to deal with the challenges. The most exciting part of the trip we don't even know yet, that's going to be overcoming the adversity along the way. We're going to meet new people, and we're going to, uh, we're going to see each event as a, as a new opportunity. Everything that happens in life is a new opportunity. So here we go. We're taking off. We're, we're doing our deal. We're meeting challenges. We have a bear that comes into our camp and eats our food while we're sitting in a boat watching him. I mean, this plate was so... They took a picture of that plate just before the bear walked up. It looked like a fish dinner on a menu. And that bear's eating that lunch, no problem. Just learning to fuel in the Arctic is a big problem. What you don't see here is the guys on the ground hand pumping the fuel up to that hose. And you, you don't see the funnel that he's putting it into in order to filter the water and the debris out so that you know that you're not making a bad fuel choice. And you don't see how rusty the barrel is that the fuel's coming out of in that picture. But there's tons of adversity along the way and challenges. And when you get home and your friends say, tell me about your trip, they don't want to hear, well, we flew for hours and hours and hours and we were bored to death most of the time. <laughs> they want to hear about the adversity and the challenges and the fun things that happened and how you overcame those challenges. And you're going to talk about the people you meet along the way. This was fantastic. I love this picture. We're in Baker Lake. If you watch the weather forecast, and they go way up into northern Canada every now and then, you'll see a sign that says Baker Lake. So there's, our, our planes are parked along here. They've brought barrels of fuel. We buy all our fuel in barrels. They brought the barrels down. They've stacked them up. We've pumped into the, the fuel. We've gone up to the northern store, which is like the Walmart of the Arctic. The northern store has everything in there from a, from a Kentucky Fried Chicken to a Subway sandwich shop, and it's a tiny little store. And if you need jeans, they got jeans. They got one style. If you need shoes, they got one kind of tennis shoes. And if you need fishing lures, they got daredevils in both the red white stripe and in the five of diamonds. But you aren't going to get 25 spoons to choose from. You're going to get two. And if you need pots and pans, everybody in town's got the same kind of pots and pans. Because the Northern Store has a broad selection of, of different things, but a narrow selection of each thing. And so we're standing there, we're just about to walk up to the northern store and get a bite to eat. And this lady here, this Inuit lady, an Eskimo is properly called an Inuit, and an Indian is properly called an Inu. And so this is an Inuit lady, and these are her five kids. And there's one other kid that's down here playing in the rocks. And we're all wearing our bug hats because the black flies are so bad, they're just swarming you. A black fly is a little tiny fly you've never seen before. It's a tiny little black fly, and they can take a hole out of your skin like you can't believe, and blood runs down. So everybody's wearing, and you can imagine the weather these people live in, then they got to put up with black flies when it finally gets nice for two months out of the year. So they're all playing on the shoreline there, all being swarmed by the black flies. And the mom's standing there, and as we're taking the picture, she says, it's just not right if all five of them aren't in the picture. And I thought, isn't that funny? It doesn't matter where you go, mom wants all the kids in the picture, right? And the one kid said, no, I'm not getting in the picture. And mom was standing, you can't tell she's pissed off because she's got her fly hood on. 
and she was happy to have us, have us take her picture. Here we are at the Boy Scout Jamboree. I met all kinds of new people. Lots of fun there. And then here we are in an Inuit village having dinner in a, in a little Inuit restaurant, and we're eating Arctic char, of all things. It's, it's fantastic. You know, it really is about the journey. It's not about the destination. So as we go through life, as we go on a trip, as we do our business, it's the journey. It's the old things we overcome. It's the adversity we face, and it's the people we meet along the way. And as we start to overcome that adversity, we build our stories. So this story is a great story. This guy's Boyd. Boyd lives in Eveleth. This is Boyd's first trip to the Arctic. Boyd is probably one of the lesser experienced pilots that flies out of that seaplane base in Eveleth. And if you talk to anybody up there, and I just saw Boyd last week, and you tell them you know Boyd, they'll say, oh yeah, Boyd, he's kind of, he's really not the sharpest pilot we've got. And I said, you know, I appreciate that. I flew with Boyd. And we saw him, we made it, he, Boyd made a mistake. He was, he was refueling on a lake. He's got his, his, his floats are full of bags of fuel. And he pulls, he lands on the lake because he's got shorter range than the rest of us have in some bigger planes. He land, we play leapfrog. We send him way out ahead in advance on an exact line to where we're going. He's not supposed to deviate from the line. When he gets so far along the way, he lands on a lake. He gets out. He's by himself in that airplane. He teeters on those floats. He gets the black bags of fuel out. They're a big, they're a, they're a water bag that's made in Switzerland for the troops to carry water in. And we... They fit in our floats good, so they're probably illegal to use as fuel bags, but we use them anyway. And you pull them up, and then you stand there on that wing strut, and you tip and you dump that fuel in there, right? And then you do the next one. Well, when he gets all done, he's refueled his plane, and we're flying along catching him now because he's on the water. And he, he primes the engine too much. And when he primes the engine too much, he puts too much gas into the cylinder. And when he starts it, it ignites, and kaboom, it blows. And it blows the end right off of his exhaust pipe. So we're flying along playing leapfrog, right? Because he's out in front of us. Now we're catching him. He says, I got a problem, man. My, my, my plane doesn't sound right. And we got one guy in our group an engineer, and he's the mechanical-minded guy. And he's like, all right, something to fix. This is going to be great. <laughs> right? Now, and he's, we're 500 miles from the nearest human. Right? And he's on late. Now, first off, we got to find him. Right? And so if he's deviated too much from his plan, and let me tell you, when the airplane's on the water and you're 2,000 feet up, the airplane is tiny. And so we find Boyd, and we get down, we get one plane, the other planes continue on to the next fuel stop. And now we're waiting and waiting and waiting. We don't know what's going on, but what he's doing is they found a tr very thin trolling spoon in somebody's, in somebody's uh, tackle box. And just by sheer luck, somebody happened to have a hose clamp and we'd always carry a little bit of safety wire. That's, you farmers would know that as bailing wire, but that's basically the same thing, safety wire. It's a soft wire that you can twist and tighten things with. And they fashioned a, a patch for this around this exhaust pipe, put the hose clamp on it, pulled it all together nice and tight with, bailing, with, this, with this safety wire, bailing wire. And then they took apart a Schweppes ginger ale can, and they covered these fuel lines with the Schweppes ginger ale can in case any hot exhaust would escape that repair and cook that line. You didn't want to have a fire. And we flew that airplane all the way home from well north of Thompson. And Boyd, the bush pilot, brought it home. And so I'm talking to his buddy pilots up there, and they're telling me, Boyd's not the best pilot. And I said, he might not be, but you know what? The rest of you sat on the ground here, and he went on the trip. So I think Boyd's the best pilot, because he's the guy that went. He's the guy that went. Everybody else turned around and talked about what, a, what kind of pilot Boyd is. But all they're doing is talking. He bought his fuel. He paid, his, he paid the man, right? And that fuel up there gets to be $8, $10 a gallon. He went on a trip. He crossed the Arctic Circle in a 1947 PA-12 that's never had anything done to it since 1947. <laughs> so he enjoyed the reward. He enjoyed the rewards of that trip. And the rewards of that trip are standing where the back river empties into the Chantry Inlet and the Chantry Inlet opens to the Arctic Ocean. And when you stand right there on those rocks and you cast into that fast water, you catch lake trout that are enormous, like this. Every cast, literally every cast, you catch lake trout like this, just huge fish. And you catch them until you're just, in fact, sometimes we'll walk out to the end of the point and we'll just take one rod for two guys. Here, you fish for a minute, I'll drink beer. Now I'll fish for a minute, you drink. Because you're catching fish so fast, you get bored. 
It's incredible the big fish you catch right there in that spot. And right up the hill, which you can't see in this picture, right up the hill there's an abandoned fish camp. Hasn't been used in 20 years. And we go over there and we undo the wire on the door and the windows are still okay. And it's just a wood floor, plywood shack. And we go in there and we sit down and, that, and, we, and we, we, we blow up our mattresses and we make that our camp for the night. And that's where we camp in that particular spot. And so you get to, if you run with the scissors, you get to enjoy the rewards of the trip. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to come with me now while I take you on this trip to the Arctic Circle. Here we go.
Thank <laughs> you.